Hi, third grade. Okay, I'm going to read you guys some writer, and this is nonfiction. This is the story of E.B. White. Um, but I want to show you the book because the pictures are beautiful and there's lots of photographs and things. So first of all, a little detail. Here are all the books he wrote. Trumpet of the Swan, Stuart Little, Charlotte's Web. And he also wrote articles for a magazine called The New Yorker. So that's pretty clever that they put that on there. Okay. And then the book is just gorgeous. Here's his family tree. And here's his family portrait. And that's in 1899. And this is him. I think, let's see. I think he actually, he's the baby. Yeah, because he's the youngest. So this is actually him, the baby. Okay, and here's a quote by him. I believe then, as I do now, in the goodness of the published word, it seemed to contain an essential goodness, like the smell of leaf mold. So he's always liked books and things that are published. Okay, here's his house. This says, Elwin and the family dog Beppo had his home in Mount Vernon, New York. So Mount Vernon, New York is not in New York City, but it's kind of close. You can take a train. It probably takes maybe 45 minutes to get into New York City. It's kind of like how you guys live close to San Francisco, but you live in a neighborhood. And here... Um, is one of the places he talks a lot about, which is Belgrave, Maine, where he goes on vacation. And here's where he lives in Mount Vernon, New York. And then here's New York City, where his father works, and then the Atlantic Ocean. Some Writer, the story of E.B. White by Melissa Sweet. And there's an old fashioned typewriter, which is how he wrote his stories. They have all the chapters. And there's a picture of him. That's E.B. White. There once was a boy from New York, and this is him. His name is Elwin on the steps of Mount Vernon. This is in 1905. So you can see why he might not use his real name. Um, and he uses just his initials. Okay, we're going to read chapter one and two. All is right with the world department. I fell in love with the sound of an early typewriter and I have been stuck with it ever since. And then it tells us, Elwyn Brooks White became a writer while he was still wearing knickers. He was seven or eight years old when he looked at a sheet of paper square in the eyes and thought, this is where I belong. This is it. These are knickers. Knickers are like shorts came to about your knee, and when you got older, you wore long pants. He was born on July 11th, 1899, and later chose 7 and 11 as his lucky numbers. That same year, in downtown New York City, not far from his home, a reservoir was being filled to make way for a new library with a children's room, where N, as he would called, would later take out books. N was about five years old when his brother Stan, whom the family called Bun because he could wiggle his nose like a bunny, taught him to read by sounding out words from the New York Times. The New York Times is a famous newspaper. It's still in circulation. I actually read it every day. If N came across a word he didn't know, his father made him look it up in the Webster's Dictionary. At dinner, his father, who loved words, recited limericks and all six children would try to finish the last line. There's a picture of him with his brother Stan and his brother Albert. And there's a picture of him with his mother. Anne's mother, Jessie, was quiet and kind. She loved her garden and raising broods of baby chicks. Each year at Christmas, she placed her dream farm, a tiny wooden farm under the Christmas tree. When he entered first grade, Anne discovered that school began with an assembly. Every day, the students recited the Pledge of Allegiance and sang a song, and the principal called on a different student to the platform to read aloud. 
he went in alphabetical order. And for years, N sat in terror as the names got closer to W. The day he heard Elwyn White, N made his way to the stage and began reading a poem from Longfellow. It had the lines, footprints on the sands of time, but Elwyn's words came out, the tans of sime. Other kids started laughing at the moment, started laughing, and the moment on stage became even worse than Anna had imagined it would be. He could not finish. He vowed never to go on stage again. On his way home, his dog Mac met him as usual at the corner. In the quiet of the barn, and tended his chicks, his lizards, and his pigeons. For six years, Mac met me at the same place after school and convoyed me home, a service he thought up himself. A boy doesn't forget that sort of association. And there's his dog, Mac. Okay, so now he's going to tell us a little bit about him as a child. And he says, I'm trying to get this right so I can read it and show it to you at the same time. As a child, I was frightened, but not unhappy. My parents were loving and kind. We were a large family and were a small kingdom unto ourselves. Nobody ever came to dinner. We lived in a large house in a leafy suburb where there were backyards and stables and grape arbors. I lacked for nothing except confidence. I suffered nothing except the routine terrors of childhood, fear of the dark, fear of the future, fear of the return to school after summer on a lake in Maine, fear of making an appearance on a platform. That's a stage. Fear that I was unknowing about things I should know about. I was, as a child, allergic to pollen and dusts, and I still am. It may be, as some critics suggest, that this, that it helps to have an unhappy childhood. If so, I have no knowledge of it. So sometimes they say to be a good writer, if you had bad things happen to you, like you had an unhappy childhood, it might be easy because you have things to write about. But he does, he says that wasn't his case. He was a happy kid, although he had normal fears. Elwin's father, Samuel White, worked at a piano company on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Manhattan is in New York City. It's, it's what we call New York City. One of the fringe benefits of being the son of a piano man, Elwin wrote later, was that the parlor, that's like the living room, at 101 Summit Ave was well supplied with musical instruments. All six kids played instruments. We were practically a ready-made band. All we lacked was talent. We had violins, cellos, mandolins, guitars, banjos, and drums. There was always a lot of music filling the air in our home, none of it good. We sang, composed, harmonized, and drummed in an attempt to raise the general tone of commotion. And here he is playing a mandolin. Anne was much younger than his siblings, so his father had more time to spend with him. Oh, the joy, the joy of my little boy. We have lots of good times together said Samuel Wright. Samuel White wrote a note to Albert and for N's, sorry, he wrote in a note to Albert and for N's 12th birthday, he gave him an optimistic note. This is a really nice letter his father wrote him. Elwin, my dear boy, all hail with joy and gladness. We salute you on your natal day. May each recurring anniversary bring you the earth's best gifts and heaven's choicest blessings. Think today on your mercies. You have been born in the greatest and best land on the face of the globe, under the best government known to man. Be thankful that you are an American. Moreover, you are the youngest child of a large family and have profited by the companionship of older brothers and sisters. This is no small matter, for you are wiser by reason of their experiences. You haven't had to learn wisdom, you have absorbed it. You are the object of the affection and solicitude of your mother and father. When you are being, when you are fretted by the smallest things of life, remember that on this your birthday, you heard a voice telling you 
to look up and out on the great things of life and beholding them say, surely they are all mine. In conclusion, I congratulate you again with my warmest felicitation. I wish you great joy. I wish you all the happiness and I wish it for you with all my heart. Father. That is very nice. Uh-oh, he's sneezing here. Achoo! One Sunday afternoon, when Ellen N. was about five years old, he and his family piled into a carriage for a ride. N. started to sneeze. His eyes became red and itchy. His parents wondered if it was the horses, but they discovered N. had hay fever and was allergic to pollen. The doctor prescribed dousing his head in cold water every morning. Later that year, Samuel White went to visit Elwyn's older brothers, Al and Stan, who were staying with friends at a camp on the Belgrade Lakes in Maine. Would the crisp, clean air and cool lakes up north help end hay fever, his father wondered. Mr. White made plans to take the whole family and their dog to Snug Harbor in Belgrade Lakes. All right, we're going to read this chapter about the lake. Once more to the lake. Life is always rich and is, sorry. Life is always a rich and steady time when you are waiting for something to happen or to hatch. Getting to Maine was as much of an adventure as summering there. The family packed for one month and took a train overnight from New York City. Mrs. White slept fully dressed so she would be ready when they arrived in Belgrade Lakes early the next morning. From there, they took a horse and a wagon 10 miles to Snug Harbor. Mr. White had rented two small cabins on the edge of the lake. We Whites were city people, and later wrote, everything about Belgrade was a new experience. The big freshwater lake, the pines and spruces and birches, the pastures with its sweet fern and juniper, the farmhouse where we took our meals, the rough camp with sparsely furnished bedrooms, the boating, the swimming, and the company of the other campers along the shore. During his summer without an end, as N. Elwin later described it, Stan taught N. how to paddle a canoe and how to use a jackknife. The brothers studied tortoises, turtles, tadpoles, and toads. In later years, they brought their homemade skiff. Jesse, named after Mrs. White, who couldn't swim and hated the water. No matter what the weather, the whole family crowded into the skiff and motored to town. Like barn swallows in a nest. At Bean's store, Miss, Mr. White bought a case of Moxie soda, assuring his family that the new drink Coca Cola would never be as popular as Moxie. Well, he was wrong about that because Coca Cola is what we call Coke, and it's still here today. And began keeping a journal. He thought the word journal sounded more writerly than diary. He wrote in his journal every day for the next 20 years. It was just a cheap notebook that was always by his bed. Every night before he tuned, turned in, he would write in the book. He wrote about things he had done, things he had seen, and thoughts he had had. Sometimes he drew a picture. He always ended up asking himself a question so he would have something to think about while falling asleep. And here he drew a grasshopper. And he diagrammed it by telling what all the parts were. And there's the top of a moxie soda. I wonder what I'm going to be when I grow up. That's his question for the day. For Anne's 11th birthday, his father gave him a green wood and canvas old town canoe. Now, the best part of summer was not just being out of school, but waking up early before the rest of the family and sneaking out onto the lake in his own canoe. He would set out along the edge of the glassy lake in the shadows of the pines, paddling quietly so as not to disturb the stillness of the cathedral, as he called the motionless water. And there he is with his brother, Albert. And there he is with his father. There was a lake, and at the water's edge, a granite rock upholstered in lichen. This was his pew, and the sermon went on forever. 
So a pew is where you sit in church and it's kind of like he's making this into a church. He's sitting there and the lake and nature is the sermon, which is the message you get when you go to church. It says it went on forever. One summer, the Whites invited Elwin's friend, Freddie Schuler to join them in Maine. 15-year-old Elwin made Freddie a brochure to prepare him for one of the most beautiful states in the Union and one of the most beautiful of the lakes of Maine and wanted his friend to love Snug Harbor as much as he did. It's so great, he made him a brochure. So here's the cover, Belgrade Lake and Snug Harbor Camps. And then he wrote at the bottom, this pamphlet was compiled by E. Elwin B. White. It is respectfully dedicated to Mr. Frederick Schuler and for his personal use. And here's the brochure. Here's a picture and he's writing a script. Maine is one of the most beautiful states in the Union and Belgrade is one of the most beautiful of the lakes of Maine. This wonderful lake is five miles wide and about 10 miles long with many coves, points, and islands. It is one of a series of lakes which are connected with each other by little streams. One of the streams is several miles long and deep enough so that it affords an opportunity for an all day canoe trip. And there's a picture of him this all day canoe trip. All of the lakes and resorts of fishermen for bass, perch, club, and pickerel are all very plentiful. The beauty of the surrounding country makes tramping a pleasure and the well-packed country roads are fine for bicycling and horseback riding. The lake is large enough to make the conditions ideal for all kinds of small boats. The bathing also is also a feature for the days grow very warm at noontime and make a good swim feel nice. And then it says Snug Harbor Camps. These camps are run by Mrs. Willard Gleason and she's from North Belgrade, Maine. The price for a room and meals is $12 a week. All necessities are furnished, including blankets. The transportation, including baggage, berth, that's where you sleep on a train, train ticket, breakfast, ride into the lake, costs about $25 a round trip. That means both ways. At Snug Harbor camps, a doctor can always be quickly summoned from the boys' camp, which is only a mile away. And then it says over here that he was learning cursive, which we call, which you guys are learning in third grade too, right? Script or cursive. He learned it about age seven. So he's really good at it. And then this is what the brochure looked like. All the pages we just read were in the middle and he folded it. And the back, he made this, which was a logo for Belgrade Lakes, Maine. So as you guys can tell, he was super creative even when he was little and he wrote a whole brochure for his friend. Okay. Freddie did join the Whites that summer and he and Elwin spent their days fishing, canoeing and swimming. Much too soon, Elwin knew it would be time to go back to school, but he also knew that when he returned the next summer, the lake would be exactly as he left it. And that is the end of chapter two. Okay, I will post this. I hope you guys enjoyed learning more about E.B. White. You can see he's influenced by nature.